specific, but I believe it's a prayer that by extension is a prayer for the well-being of our community, our, our state, our nation. The best hope for St. George, Utah is that there be Christian homes all over this place. And there are some, are there some who, where that's is supposed to be the case, right? Well, may there be homes where the Bible is loved and taught. And so there's a question. Is the Bible loved and taught in your home? Dad, Mom, I'll just say if you don't teach it and love it, who's going to in your home? Something will be loved and taught in your home. May it be the Word of God. Is the Master's will sought? Does every person in the home know that it is the Master's will that is sought? Who should ensure that that happens? Who, who needs to set the pace? Fathers... Are we true and strong? Do we lead our homes so that they're free from the blight of wrong? Fathers, are we leading our homes so that they are joyous with love and song? There's no way to read the gospel, to read the Bible, and miss the joy and the love and the reason to sing that the gospel brings about. So let me just ask, is your home characterized by love and song? May God give us Christian homes where the children are led to know Christ and His Lordship. May God give us homes where the altar fires burn and glow. Now that's a, a metaphor, but... Do you worship God in your home? Have your families seen you on your knees ever or praying? We just asked God for those things, did we not? May I tell you that Satan in all his fury and rage cannot stop those things from happening. Sure, he might imprison you eventually if you do these things, but in your prison cell, you can have joy and song. We read about that in the Bible, don't we? You can pray and love God's Word wherever you are. Satan can't stop that. Men who are called to lead your homes, let me just say that the only power on earth, since God has willed that this happen and He's pleased with it, that means the only power on earth that can stop this from happening is you. Are you a hindrance to this kind of home? Is your home a, a little assembly of people who live for God's glory? The Puritans like to think of the family as a little church. And... If we take some of the technical meaning out of that, I agree. It should be a little assembly of people who live for God's glory. They have to have a leader. They have to be led. So, now there are some homes where the father is not present. Somebody has to step up. And I would say, if we see homes like that, we ought to reach out to those homes. And those who are in those homes, you're not exempted from living for the glory of God just because dad's not there or dad doesn't care. This is what we're after. Now today I want to preach to you from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. That's where we're going to go and, and see the, the coming together of this idea of fatherhood and leadership in the home as it relates to leadership in the church. Leaders who are men in the biblical sense, who are pursuing biblical manhood, and who are pursuing leadership in families according to the biblical standard, 
This is the pattern for leadership within a local church. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. This is in the context of Paul instructing Timothy, who was uh, ministering at Ephesus at the time that, that he received this letter. And it's clear that Ephesus had a plurality of elders or bishops. That's a word that's sometimes translated for the episkopos, and here it's overseer and pastors. They, those are synonymous in Scripture. Uh, overseer, elder, pastor, synonymous. But Timothy is receiving instructions. Here are the people you need to look for to be overseers in the church, Timothy. Acts 20 makes it clear there's a multi, uh, there is a plurality of these in one church. That's what he's giving, but I want you to, we're going to give our attention to verses 4 and 5. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Father, help us to understand the truth of your word. Help us to understand biblical manhood, biblical fatherhood, how that relates to church leadership. May your will be done today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the idea of father, we, I think we all have a pretty good understanding of of. Uh, at least what that what that is in a human standpoint. God is described as father, the father of Israel, nine times in the books that are often called the Old Testament. And and just because we kind of touched on this in the adult Bible study time, <clears throat> all of those books are not the Old Testament, not the Mosaic covenant those books contain the mosaic covenant the one that hebrews refers to as passing away or obsolete they also contain the abrahamic and the new covenants for example so please let's not think of them as well that's the old stuff and anything we find there that's that's old and you know we've got an updated improved version that is not the relationship between what we call the old and the new testaments all of it is the inspired inerrant word of god so we need to be careful to think of that. But in, <clears throat> it is not the most common way to describe God in the books that we call the Old Testament, Father. However, nine times he is referred to as the Father of Israel. He is referred to various individuals as Father 15 times. And there are many instances of the idea of him being a father where the word Father is not actually used, where he talks about my son Israel or, or, or uh, some individual like in Deuteronomy 131 or Hosea 11, 1 to 4. Uh, that one's a famous one. Out of Egypt I've called my son and clearly that means Israel in, in Hosea's context. Of course, Matthew applied that to Jesus and the fact that he went down to Egypt as well. So there's an additional referent there in Matthew. But so... The fatherhood of God is definitely present in the Old Testament, but it is, it, it, it kind of explodes when Jesus comes. And the reason is this, no one comes to the Father except by me, okay? When Jesus is on the, on the scene, the details of the gospel just explode into all manner of information that that, say, Abraham just didn't have. He didn't have that. And so Jesus used the term Father. It seems to be his favorite term for the first person of the Godhead. Father. He used that over and over. And the word that he most likely said was Abba. Abba. We don't need to overdo this, but that does imply a level of intimacy. Um that that is appropriate to a father-son relationship. In the synoptic gospels, Jesus used that 65 times. Now it comes to us in Greek, but Jesus almost certainly was not speaking in Greek when he said these things, so probably Aramaic, so he probably said Abba, but it's come to us as pater in Greek. Uh, three times it just records that he said Abba, and then the other times he likely said Abba, but it was 
given by the, by the Holy Spirit to the gospel writers in Greek. So 65 times, the word synoptic means seen together. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. You can do some research on that if you want to. Uh, by the way, there's this thing called, if you search it, you may see the problem, uh, the synoptic problem, the problem of the synoptic gospels. Believe it or not, the academic world sees it as a problem that there's so much overlap of detail between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. <laughs> uh, I'll just tell you, I do not have a synoptic problem. Amen. Of course there's overlap. Anyway, that's another topic. In the, book, in the Gospel of John, it's recorded over a hundred times, Jesus using the word Father. In Paul's writings, it's more than 40 times. So you see in the New Testament, it's just pervasive, the idea of God as Father. Well, earthly fathers have a high standard because God is called Father. I mean, we have an opportunity to teach something about the communicable attributes of God, something about what can be known about God through seeing His image in us, in our roles as Father. Now, there's been a lot of pushback among, uh, you know, we call, we, we say liberals. I would just say those who don't believe the Bible. If you don't believe the Bible, then maybe you have an agenda and an idea that you want God to be like. I prefer God to be. But see, from the biblical standpoint, that's idolatry and is worth nothing except, uh, you know, you're in the, the fast lane to the lake of fire. So we don't want that. We want the biblical concept, the biblical concept of fatherhood. God is a father. Uh, I, heard, I heard a lady who at one time, unfortunately, taught at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary say that despite the fact that God, uh, Jesus referred to God as Father so many times, that He only did so because He was a product of His times. And uh, then she said we should refer, for example, to the Holy Spirit alternatively as He, She, and It. Now, once Albert Moeller was made president of the Southern Baptist Seminary, uh, Southern Seminary, he uh, terminated her teaching there so that churches like ours were not funding her teaching of, of this nonsense and heresy. Um, but, but that's the idea. There have been people who thought, I would rather think of God just as the parent. Of, of course God is beyond maleness and femaleness as we know it. I mean, he's the creator. John 4, God is spirit. Uh, God the Father does not have flesh and blood. He's well beyond that. He transcends it. But the issue is how has He chosen to reveal Himself to us? When He communicates to us, how does He describe Himself for our benefit? And He does so with the word Father, which is why Jesus taught His disciples to pray. When they said, teach us to pray, He said, pray like this, Father, our Father who is in heaven. He didn't say parent, he said father. So that's, that's who we're representing in fatherhood. But in our passage today, we're talking about church leadership. This passage is very crucial, I think, because it means that the pattern for church leadership is the family unit, the home. That's the pattern. It doesn't mean necessarily that single men are are not allowed to serve as church leaders as a matter of fact you get in some very uh serious problems when you look at the church leaders in the new testament and their marital status for example paul not to mention the lord jesus but the home is a place where there is a little assembly it's very basic it's very crucial it's small and either leadership is happening there or not if leadership is not happening there, then the question is, well, how would it happen in a wider, uh, a wider uh, arena? So let's look at what we see here. In verse 4, <clears throat> one who would be an overseer seer, must manage his own household well. He must manage. First of all, I want to see that he manages. Now this is a word that means to stand before, to rule over. And it's used again 
in verse 5, if someone does not know how to manage his own household. And the, 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 the scripture here is to manage it well, and that means efficiently and effectively. It does talk about effective leadership, to manage it well. A home in chaos cannot be said to have been managed well, even though good efforts might have been made. A home in chaos is, is described here when you, when you look at the phrase, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. See, this, this is the, the words that were chosen by the Holy Spirit when Paul wrote, what does it look like if a household is being managed well? Well, the most obvious one is that the children are in submission. They're under control. The people that are supposed to be recognizing the authority are not in uh, chaotic rebellion uh, and, and unable to be controlled, but rather they are submissive. But I want you to see something else here. This management happens with dignity. This is not tyrannical um, show of force. Uh, this is not with such a sternness and a threatening uh, presence uh, that everybody is scared that something evil might happen, violently evil, if, if, if this person is crossed. No, this is a manager. This is a ruler, an administrator, someone who is the standing first. Literally, the Greek has to say, he, he stands first. He's, when it's time, okay, for this family to be here he leads them. He's the one that stands in first place to deal with whatever has to be dealt with. And he does it with dignity. Uh, Rogers and Rogers commented that this word uh, for dignity avoids the suggestion of sternness, yet retains the idea of natural respect. That's an important phrase, natural respect. That cannot be commanded or demanded then it wouldn't be natural. It has to include living out what you say is important. Natural respect cannot happen when what is said does not match up with what is done. Natural respect can only happen when there's an in integrity that's in place so that what is happening on the... Uh, in the words is what's happening in the deeds and in the attitude. There's a respectful obedience that comes when children are in submission according to this standard. Now I want you to look at Titus chapter 1. In a very similar way, Paul, uh, if you look in chapter, five, uh, chapter 1 verse 5, Paul says to Titus, and this is self-explanatory. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So they had previously discussed this. There need to be elders, plural, in every town or place. Some translations say singular. Elders, uh, and they are called an overseer in verse 7, for an overseer. So elder and overseer used interchangeably here. And then we're talking about overseers. First Timothy 3, now we've got the word elder used in Titus 1, but I want you to look in verse 6. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and that literally in Greek is a one-woman man. And that's a different topic. But his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Now the SV has chosen to translate that, the word uh, believers, but others, like the King James, the New King James, and others say faithful. I believe that this is parallel to Timothy. I do not believe that, that, that Paul gave one standard to Titus and another uh, in Crete and another to Timothy in Ephesus. As if in Ephesus a man is qualified as long as his children are submissive. But in Crete he's only qualified if he leads all of his children to saving faith. I believe that since grammatically and uh, one of the meanings, possible meanings of the word that's used here in Titus 1.6 is just faithful, I believe that that's the way it's best understood. 
not making it a requirement that all the children of a person must have genuine saving faith. One of the practical things would be, how long would you wait before you go ahead and decide, okay, this person has genuine saving faith? I mean, where do you draw the line? At age 15, we're going to make a call. Does this person have genuine saving faith? Yes, okay, his father is qualified. No, not qualified. At age 20, 50, that's, that's hard. What helps us also is the next phrase. The next phrase. <clears throat> his children are believers, and, and if, if that's the best way to say it, believers, shouldn't we just expect not unbelievers or not rejecting the gospel or something like that. But instead it says, believers are not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Some translations say dissipation right here. I think not open to the charge of debauchery and insubordination or insubordination is simply an, a, a, a phrase that helps us to understand what's, what it means in 1 Timothy for children to be in submission. They're not in rebellion. They're not in dissipation. They're not rejecting the the uh, order that's being put into their lives by the leadership of their father, but they, they are led. They are people who are led. And they are led because there's a good, clear leader who is leading clearly and living clearly according to the standards that he's leading. And so I believe that's what we have here. But, but the phrase that I think is very important when you go back to chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. And by the way, those are parallel passages. If you're going to study the qualifications of church leaders, pastors, overseers, elders, you need to read 1 Timothy 3 and you need to read Titus 1 and read them together. Okay? Those are the two passages that explicitly deal with this issue. Uh, but what has caused me to land here on Father's Day is what we see in verse Five, if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Now these words, <clears throat> the word for manage is the same one in Greek as was found in verse 4. He must manage if someone does not know how to manage. That is to, to rule over, to, ad, to, to be an administrator over, to superintend, to manage, to, to stand before, to provide leadership. If he can't do it in the home, how's he going to do it in the church? And the implication is that that is the kind of leadership that ought to happen. It ought to be fatherly. It ought to be with affection and genuine concern. As a matter of fact, that's what we have here in the phrase when we see, uh, if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? That word care, epimaleo in the Greek, means uh, to exercise concern for. And, and when you read the other words that uh, derive from the same root, you get the idea of giving careful attention to, giving thorough attention to. So this is clearly uh, a description of what kind of ministry is required in the church. It's, it's affectionate. It's attentive. It, it, it has concern. <laughs> And that is what ought to be happening in the home. You see, what we have here, and we need to be clear on this, especially you men. I think there's been a tendency to think, well, I don't think God is calling me to be an elder, overseer, pastor. Therefore, 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, and, and other verses there, and Titus 1, 5 to 9, do not apply to me. That's not true at all. 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 describe basic, run-of-the-mill Christianity. And from among those men who are just living out normal, uh, what is expected level of Christianity, from among those men, then we're going to have uh, our, our leaders. If they're not living up to normal Christianity, certainly they don't need to be leaders in the church. So please do not think, well... I got a lower standard than what I read here because I'm not called to be an elder or a deacon when you read there in 1 Timothy 3. And that's not true. That's not true. What's described here is just normal Christianity, okay? So again, the question we start, now, now though we've gone over into church leadership, we're back right back to the home, every one of us. 
How much attention are you giving? And listen, this, this is an area where I have to be careful. If I'm going to care for not only God's church, if I'm going to uh, epimaleo, that is to exercise concern for, give attention to, be thorough with my, my, my shepherding of the flock, I must be doing that at home. I must. I may not remain qualified for church leadership as I neglect my own family for the sake of a wider group called the church. I heard a preacher say one time, if you're willing to sacrifice your family on the altar of ministry, shut up and get out of the pulpit because God is not calling you. That is clearly true from 1 Timothy 3. And I would even say this, the biggest difference for the gospel to go out, I believe, though I pray that God would raise up great preachers of the word and raise up many elders to care for and give attention to the flock of God, if all Christian men would live up to what we see here, the difference would be amazing, a blessing. And there would be, listen to this, far less need for church level pastoral ministry in homes if the as the puritans called it the little pastors of the little churches of the home were caring for that flock Amen. and let me just say this because of the depravity of fallen humanity if you neglect your little flock at home Either somebody else will have to provide that ministry or they will be lost for all eternity. And even among saved people, they will never grow. Somebody has to disciple. Somebody has to teach. Who spends the most time in their lives? Who can give the most careful attention to the people in your family? It has to be the father, the husband in each home. That's the design. I'm well aware that circumstances have robbed many homes. I mean, this fallen world, there's injustice, there's sickness, there's disease, there's death. What do we read, though, about the fatherless? Who pleads their cause? God himself. Because who is he? He is God the Father. And his plan of salvation carried out by the Son and applied by the Spirit, includes all that is needed for even the fatherless to receive the ministry that they need from God. This idea of fatherhood points us to God, points us to the gospel, points us to ministry, and it is the reason this is the standard. This is the standard for leadership. So if it is the standard, we ought to think just for a moment well, how, do, how ought we to do that? We, we've got a little idea here. And, and the word care, the ESV translates care in Acts 20, 28. Paul, talking to the elders of the Ephesian church when he met them at Miletus, says the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And he says to, to pastor, to shepherd the flock of God. The Greek word poimen, uh, but the ESV translates it as care. I think that's a, a good bringing together of two terms in, under the word, English word care, giving attention to, uh, exercising concern for. That's what it ought to look like. Pastoral ministry ought not to just be a series of decrees and then say, good luck, hope you can do it. That's not, it, it's, it's coming alongside, it's living life together, it's helping, but it's, tr it's, it's trusting and expecting that in each household, discipleship is going on as well. And where there is a need for that, pastors and men in the church look to fill that need. So it's shepherding, it's caring. But fatherhood itself, we read about it. We read about it in Proverbs. Listen again. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. Listen, the, the attention and the concern includes discipline in the home. I had a 
I had an educational psychology teacher say one time, just ignore the bad behavior and praise the good behavior. She was teaching a group of, of teachers. And I thought back to some of the things that I experienced when I was in school and maybe, well, some people in the classroom were doing it. I will not disclose whether it was me or other people, but the things that I observed when teachers did not address uh, sin, my thought when that teacher said it that day was, if we follow that, the building will be destroyed. Eventually it will. It, it, it will eventually cause physical harm and the building, the, even the grounds will not survive if we say let's ignore the bad behavior and praise the good. Because you know what happens when in the classroom setting of a, a group of many unregenerate people, if you ignore their misbehavior and praise the good, then the people who are doing good are going to say, well, I want to be thought of as being cool too. What can I do to get out of this category of good and be popular. That's what happens. That's why love includes discipline. Now we all know this. We have a sense of justice. Everybody's sense of justice is most robust when it comes to when, when they are personally wronged. <laughs> if you want to see, you can go, you can go to an anarchist convention. You could find the most liberal people who celebrate relativism and take a crowbar and knock their windshield out in their car and you will discover they have a sense of absolute justice. Every one of them. Not a single one will go, oh man, that was cool. Do you see how those glasses were, pieces of glass were flying? That's awesome. Shoot a hole in their tire. Yeah, I like this. Did you hear that sound? That was a neat sound. And now I'm walking back the 20 miles that I came here. That's not what's going to happen. Every person has this idea. This, this is Romans 2. We know right and wrong. That's why discipline is a form of love. It's a form of love. You cannot claim to be caring for someone if there's no discipline. Let me give you an example of this, a bad example, a wrong example, an example not to follow from a, an unlikely source because of so many of the things said about him. Let me, let me tell you the result and then, then we'll acknowledge the reason for this. In 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, Verse 1 says this, now King David was old and advanced in years. Verse 5 says, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. Now, you know your Bible history. Was Adonijah the one that was to be king after David? But Adonijah said, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. You say, where did this rebellion come from? Listen to this next verse. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done thus and so? That's why. And because when you read in 2 Samuel 11, David's sinfulness and the, the consequence of that, the consequence of that announced by Nathan and 2 Samuel 12, 10, the sword shall never depart from your house. And you can read in 2 Samuel 13 of, uh, are, are the verses following of Amnon, one of David's sons, and Tamar, one of his daughters, who was Absalom's brother. Absalom's rebellion caused great grief. You read uh, chapter 18, verse 33, Absalom had done everything he could to humiliate David, and yet David loved him. When he learned that he had died, he said, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, oh, that I had died instead of you. But you know what? He was willing at that moment when the loss was real and it happened, 
He was saying, I, I wish I could die instead of you. But you know what he had not been willing to do? He had not been willing to be obedient to God. He had not been obedient to tell Adonijah, you need to stop doing that. He had not disciplined his sons, and he experienced rebellion in his house, in his heart, and then in his household. It's all a matter of obedience. That's a bad example. What are we told to do to avoid that? A couple of verses. Ephesians 6, verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This idea of provoke to anger, this avoids severe, tyrannical discipline and involves coming alongside of corrective, instructive discipline. It's not so much punitive with no idea of correction. It's, it's corrective. It attempts to stop movement in one direction and get movement going in another. And just simply, oh, you did that? I don't like that. So I'm going to do something to you that you don't like. That's not helpful, is it? That will provoke the children. Fathers don't do that. Instead, what does it say to do? Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Look to Jesus. How did Jesus teach? How did Jesus, did he refrain from saying hard things? He did not. But the, he said them with authority because he spoke the word of God. And he said them lovingly. He said hard things and he said things like, come to me. All you labor, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Is that kind of heart you have? Are you known for that among your children? Are you just known for don't displease dad? If he doesn't like what you're doing, there's no, no telling what he's going to do. Instruct, bring them up, bring them up. Colossians 3.21 tells us, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. See, the idea is the bringing up, the raising not the, not the punishment. You are not the avenger of right. The Lord says, vengeance is mine, but you are the teacher, the instructor, and the one who is to speak the truth and love in your own household. Let it not be said of you, he never said a single word that displeased his son. You need to correct. That's what needs to happen. And that's what needs to happen in families. That's what needs to happen in the church. Loving, correction where it's called for. That's why when you read the, the epistles, especially the pastoral epistle, epistles, you're going to find Timothy and Titus call many, many times to rebuke, admonish, exhort with all authority, command, charge. These are the words that are used. Why is that? Because when, 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 the, when a father or a man, a man has demonstrated that he is godly, and he is a normal Christian, and he's doing the things that normal Christians ought to do, and then the call of God is recognized on his life, and he moves into the position of teaching the Word of God, by definition, he must have authority. Because it's God's authority. If you're not able to do this, you're not, you don't understand the Bible. When you come to this meeting and hear this preacher, you should go away at least saying that was authoritative. If you didn't, I have failed because I'm not telling you my ideas. I'm telling you the word of God, what God has said. What does God say about fatherhood? And we do that and we don't consult Oprah and we don't consult the alt-right or the liberals or anybody else say, how are y'all going to like this? It doesn't matter. That's why uh, our brother Eklos is in prison. He obeyed God. He didn't ask, so should I do evangelism? The answer to that is yes, wherever you are, right? The Chinese government might say, do not hand out Bibles. Do not evangelize. What did Jesus say? All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. His authority trumps. So... Don't go to any other source to find out what, how am I supposed to act as a husband, as a father? Go to the Word. You do that. Model that for everybody in your household. And then tell them that's what you did. And when, you, when they see that's what you did, and then hear you teach them how to do it, they will be in submission. 
there will be a natural respect that's there because they see what you're saying is in, is just what you're living out. You're explaining the reality of your life. How churches would be strengthened if men would take this mantle the awesome responsibility of having a role defined as father when God himself has that description. Father, be godly. Be godly. Make the gospel clear in your home. Make the implications of the gospel clear in your home. Live by being an evangelist. Live by the implication of the gospel personally. And you will see the, re the natural respect of those in your household come to you. And you'll be able to lead and manage well your household. May the Lord grant us strength and grace to do so. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for showing us your design for structure and leadership. Thank you for showing us and giving us a way to evaluate whether or not these things are happening. It's in the home. Thank you that you care for us. You care enough to say, I'm father to you. And then you also give us earthly fathers. Help all of us who are earthly fathers to live out our responsibilities. And Lord, you promise the fatherless that you take up their cause. Help us to be mindful of those who have a lack of this ministry in their lives and help us to step up and to provide that. Lord, help us to focus on our own behavior, our own attitude as we think of these things. Thank you for being our Father in Christ. Thank you for the picture of fatherhood that you built into the family. Help us to live it out in such a way that you're glorified and the gospel is clear. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. There is